sponsored by the James Madison Council and the National Endowment for the Arts. Hello. Welcome to the 2021 Library of Congress National Book Festival. I'm Alexander Chi, uh, contributing editor to The New Republic, and I'm here to talk to Yi Yun Lee and Douglas Stewart about their new novels. And I do not, are they in the room? There they are. <laughs> here we are. <laughs> oh, what a relief. <laughs> yes, um, we're here. So uh, it's a little impossible to, I was thinking of how to set this up and I thought I would, uh, I would give you each some of the same questions and you can take turn an turns answering as a format for this. Um, and the first one is sort of a, a big picture uh, philosophical uh, creature, um, which is uh, if all novels are written out of a, a discontent of some kind um, and are inherently a critique of the world, what would you say is under your eye in these in this book? Oh, Douglas, you go first. <laughs> That's such a good. Oh, <laughs> that was a that was a dirty move, Yi Yun. But I, but I. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think what I was trying to do was to write a post-industrial novel or a novel about. Uh, society failing and not to center men in it, not to center heterosexual men. Shuggy Bain obviously stands in a long literary tradition. Uh, we think about Kelman and Welsh. Uh, we even think about the cinema of Ken Loach, but uh, not often enough do they focus on the private lives of women, the domestic lives of women and their children, and also certainly queer characters. So for me, there was always an enormous amount of uh, strength and resilience and love and humor and hope in those voices that you never heard, but it was really wrapped in a lot of silence. Well, Beautiful for answer. me, I think that's a great answer. You know, can I just borrow that? That's, <laughs> I, I think for me, <laughs> for me, it is, um, it's about taking a long look at life and taking a long look at history, you know, for my book, there's this woman, she's 81 now, and she's looking back at her life. And, you know, one key moment was the loss of her child. You know, there are different ways to write about loss. But I, I think when I was writing the book, I really wanted to have the character to take a long look 40, 40 years after she lost her child. I wanted her to come in from that perspective to look at life and to look at, you know, American history. So, so I, I just, I don't want my characters to get stuck in a traumatic or dramatic moment. I wanted to move the characters past, past that moment for, you know, into the future. That's my, I guess that's my goal. <laughs> Um, also beautiful. The uh, so the the next question here is uh, related to an experience I've had with my own books. I'm assuming that it's a somewhat common experience, just from just anecdotally. Maybe maybe this has never happened to you, but um, but there's always some point after the book comes out where someone who has read the book says something to you that reveals to you something that you didn't understand that you had made, but that you can see within the book. And I wondered if you had had that experience with this book yet, and if so, if you would share it. Well, I'll go first, Douglas, <laughs> for one time. Please. I, I, well, I think my that moment came actually before the book was published. I think just the first draft, between the first draft and final draft, I think it's just my editor reading it. And he said, this woman has a, a entire, you know, body in a, in a cast without, you know, any vulnerability. And where's the chink? 
where's the i i just realized you know when we write about characters and especially when i i feel like for me is when we write about characters with some you know painful experience my instinct is to be protective and to not to show too much emotion to not to show too much you know response and i think that when the editor points out this woman is just you know indestructible which is probably true but on the other hand even the you know most indestructible character has the moment of doubt and disbelief and those things i think that really needed a character to i mean sorry they really do need a reader to point out hmm. douglas yeah. You know, Agnes Bain as the heroine of the novel is a very, uh, she's a very bright, glamorous, generous, funny woman, but she's also incredibly damaged. And we know that she starts to disintegrate and turn into alcoholism uh, or turn towards it. But I had wanted to show Agnes as a, as complex as a character as I could manage, just to have many facets, so that in the book she was never just a mother. She was never these children's mother. She was, you know, she was a friend and she was a foe and uh, she was a spurned wife. She was many, many different things. But it's really funny because a lot of the misogyny that happens in the book happens between women, even though it was an incredibly yeah. misogynistic time and it was a patriarchy. And what is always really um, what is really surprising to me, and this is not a condemnation, is when people are hard on Agnes, because I always think that Agnes loses the most in my novel. You know, she loses her future and her life and her love and her children. And yet people are very, readers can be quite angry with her. And it's usually female <laughs> readers too, which I think is really uh, fascinating because uh, they often say things to me, wow, she really didn't love her children. And I think to myself, oh. actually, I think she really did love her children. She might not love herself very much. Um, and they're different things. So that was something I wasn't quite prepared for. That is fascinating, uh, especially given your stated aim about uh, related to misogyny uh, with writing the novel. Yeah. The, so all of us, I think, write novels, for those of us who do write novels, uh, partly to try to learn something uh, whether we've expressed that to ourselves or not, there's a curiosity that drives us, something that we're like, what is this like, or what is this like? And, and so I'm wondering uh, what you found, if it was what you set out to find, or if you surprised yourself, or, or some mix of both. Yeah. Can I answer that first? Uh, <laughs> this time? <laughs> You know, Shuggy Bane is absolutely a work of fiction. It is not the narrative of my childhood, but I'm always really clear that I am the son of a single mother who also suffered with addiction my entire childhood and, and lost that struggle. You know, I grew up as poor as Shuggy. I grew up as isolated and as queer and, and just as separate from, from the world. But I think when you're a child of trauma, you know, sometimes when you go to write fiction, you you center the child, you center yourself in that narrative. And the thing that actually took me 10 years to write was to try and take the, the young boy out of the heart of the story because it was far too complex of a time for everything to be filtering through this seven or eight year old. And what I really needed to do was to try and come to a point of empathy with perhaps the world and the people and the, you know, the themes that were, were causing all this hurt for both me and my personal childhood and also for the characters in the book. And one of the things that was, people often ask me if writing the book was cathartic and it was, but it wasn't cathartic because I was giving away pain. It was cathartic because I came to understand the origins of the pain and where the hurt started. And actually the truth became that the hurt had no origin because there was just hurt everywhere. You know, the men were hurting women and the women were hurting and then they were hurting their children. And it was sort of bouncing around like that. And, and when I, when I tried, when came to that realization, it changed the book for me, but it also was something that fundamentally altered me as both a writer and a man. Hmm. Diana, have you uh, yes. had a chance to reflect? That's a, you know, these answers. <laughs> it, it's, a, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult question to ask only because 
I think when we start a novel, there are so many things about it characters we don't know and you know at the end of the novel at the end of writing the novel you feel that you have got to know your characters a little bit a little bit better than at the beginning but i i think for me it goes back to that time you know i i, I think i have said this in the interview so unfortunately this child uh, this narrator this uh lilia who's the main character of the mother character in the novel just by accident, my life, you know, overlapped with her life at one moment, you know, I'd lost a child at the age when I already wrote her into the novel, already wrote that her loss of a child. So I think that actually stopped me from writing because I did not want my experience to overshadow the narrator or the character's experience. I don't want my life to bleed into the character's life. And I think in the end, when I was able to continue was more about finding what could be different for another mother who had a similar experience. So my, I guess my curiosity is really, you know, I was in, in, in the moment of loss writing about another woman 40 years after the loss. So I, I think my curiosity is how time passes for her, how she lives her life from that point on. And by writing a novel, I would say I got a little bit of an answer for that is, you know, she went on to, she had other children, she had other parts of life, she had garden, she cooked. It was really just to make sure i guess she just she was making sure every day was filled with activities so that's probably answered my curiosity about years later that i haven't been there hmm so uh you are both at uh very different stages of your careers um douglas just starting out Ian, you are definitely in the, you are in the full middle. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm such a middle-aged woman. <laughs> well, I didn't want to put it that way, but mid-career artist. Um, and, uh, and so I wondered, I wondered if, Douglas, if you have a question for Ian. Uh, yeah, I think the, I think the, one of the questions is, is how do you, sustain a career what has been the most important thing for you book after book to to continue going um right right a big oh my question. god <laughs> that's a big question you know it, it is surprising just to realize i you know i i st sometimes i still feel like a young writer right it just started and all of a sudden you have all these books i think Patience, maybe the the thing I, well, when I was working on my first novel, I, I remember there was a moment I was thinking, oh, I cannot wait to finish this. I just, I'm dying for this book to be done and to be read instead of just, you know, working through this terrible mm -hmm. experience. It's just not long writing experience. I, I, not, I think after a few books, that kind of eager feeling is gone and and it's becoming part of just the awareness that whatever I'm working at this moment will be read in five years, maybe, you know, maybe even in 10 years. And that is all right. I don't know. I just feel once I realize that, oh, life is becoming a little easier for me as a writer. How, actually, maybe a part, a second part to the question, how do you process both praise and criticism and stay true to the, the thing that you're doing? Or do you let it affect you? Well, certainly, I think at the beginning, I may have, you know, heard both praise and criticism a little more than I do now. You know, I, 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 I you know, I'm reading, I'm like, I, I, I'm, I'm leading a Tolstoy reading group now, and also last year, just reading War and Peace with many readers. And one thing I learned is each reader has a different reading of the same book. So a lot, I think a lot of readers were criticisms. It's what they want. I think because they're reading the book, they want the book to be, or they're not reading the book. I'm 
or an author who means the book to be. So in any case, I think criticism, I don't know, I, I feel that, I, I, I think it's actually a blessing that we write a book and five years later, or, you know, I don't know, Douglas, how long have you been working, how, how long did you work on your first novel? But it's a long time before the book comes out. And by then, I feel that my creative energy and my creative, you know, I think activity has moved on. So, you know, praises are all right. Criticism are all right. I learned that from my mentor, William Trevor. He said when he when he was young writer, he would every time you know a book came out, he would go, he would go to the pub, order a double whiskey, and getting drunk on all these terrible reviews. <laughs> and then he <laughs> said he realized <laughs> he realized that after a while, I mean, he has had a long career. He said the praises don't really help you write better, and the criticism really rarely helps you either. So I think I when he said that, I found it really encouraging and heartening mm. thank you that how long did you i'm cool. just curious sorry just no, curious right. how long did you everything. right yeah, how long did you work me, on it, the book yeah it took me 10 yeah, years to write the book i wrote the book over a 10 uh oh sorry i just, <laughs> i hope no, I, no, no, no. I just wanted to be clear uh, uh i it took me 10 years to write the book but the strange thing about shaggy bain is I didn't have an MFA and I didn't have a circle of writer friends. So the 10 years was truly spent in isolation. The only person who read it was my was my husband. And uh, he was enormously helpful with the editing and the encouragement and uh, making sure I ate at regular intervals. But it was a, an incredibly lonely place. And because I'd come from a different creative industry, you, you and I actually came from industrial design, I loved the isolation because then I was very sure that what I was creating was only for myself. And, and as I advance in my career, I find myself longing for that isolation. I certainly long for the, the you know, uh, the support of a circle of writer friends and a writing community. But creatively, I like to return to that place where it's just me in conversation with my work. Well, I was going to ask if you had any questions for Douglas, <laughs> but also I, sort I of just... like, from, but so you did that beautifully, but I wondered, um, I wondered also if, you know, as the more senior writer, shall we say, uh, of the two of you, if you have any questions for someone who has just debuted. Right. Um, I, I wonder, well, <laughs> It's, for someone who's, do you, okay, this is such a nosy question, <laughs> Douglas, you just <laughs> have to it. forgive me. <laughs> do you think writing the second novel, you know, has the reception for Shaggy Bang or has, you know, these PR, has it affected how you approach your second novel? I mean, I know it's done now, so it's, Probably yeah. <laughs> we're in the so middle. The of it. So just give us <laughs> that's right. Just give well, us the, a sense of how the second novel is like. Well, one of the really strange things about my career, I think, is that actually my second novel was finished before Shaggy Bane was oh. published. Oh, wow. And also finished, so edited before I won the Booker. So it ha it will have that sort of sense of um it was something that I wrote only for myself without, with the comfort of ignorance, let's call it. Um, uh, certainly right now, going on to write my third novel, I definitely hear a lot of voices in the room and I feel pressure. I feel the pressure less from a prize point of view and more from a, I want to make sure the readers have that same emotional connection with the characters. And am I taking the time and patience, as you said earlier, to really build this world and immerse the readers uh, with people that they can sort of touch and, and really feel. Um, and so I'm finding that a little bit harder, but I'm in a, a strange situation where I've been writing for a long time. I've just only been publishing very recently. Yes. I think that's a good And I'm place grateful to for be. it because it, it's because I haven't written very much this past year. So I'm so oh, grateful right. that I had that other book complete. Right, right. I love that, uh, I love that expression of it. Um, that's such an interesting approach. It's almost like you're you're doing a surprise attack on publishing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. I might I, 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 I might pay for the wrong that surprise word, attack, but... but we'll we'll just have to see. 
<laughs> it reminds me of something that uh, Deborah Eisenberg did something like that, where she said uh, that she had written a great deal before she finally started publishing. And so <clears throat> it allowed her to give off the impression of like a certain momentum when in fact, like all these, all these things had been written much earlier. Oh. Okay, so uh, we are we have some questions in uh, in from readers uh, in Slido uh, for those of you who are watching who have not yet put in a question, please do. Um, uh, um, this first one is delightful. Do you hide any secrets in your books that only a few people will find? And uh, and then. My addition to that question would be, and what are they? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> or could you give us that one question. example? Yeah, I'll let you go first, Yuyun. Oh, I do that all the time. And mostly, nobody would be able to detect it but myself. I, I think it's just part of the... I mean, writing itself is a long process, but every day it's just about maybe just putting daily life, make a marker of my daily life in my writing. But it's always very minor, the most minor thing, you know, for instance, a bird, you know, a, a goose flies past. So I may have the goose in that day's writing, which, you know, probably only matters to me. And I did have, I did have a misreading of a very good book. It it's called the it's a Rebecca West novel. Uh, an, it's an essay by Rebecca West called the better the better battlefield. And somehow I was very sleepy. I read it into the Buttercup battlefield, and it baffled me so much. And I loved it because it just it was mysterious. The, Buttercup battlefield, and it turned out it's not better. Buttercup, better, better battlefield. Sorry, it sounds like a tongue twister. So I decided to take that for my for a story title. Really, just because of my silly misreading, I used the Buttercup battlefield for a story title. I love that. <laughs> I love that. <clears throat> That's great, I, Douglas. Uh, yeah, I think the only thing that I've I've been trying to do and hide within it is certainly in Shuggy Bane, there's a character when we meet Shuggy at 15, he's working for a, he's called, uh, he's a supermarket manager and I call him a parsimonious bastard. And his name is mm -hmm. Mr. Killfeathers. And then when we go back in the book, we realize that Shuggy's grandmother has had some kind of sexual affair with another Mr. Killfeathers. And so you know, they don't know this about each other, obviously, but uh, there is sort of the connections there. And I did that very deliberately because what I actually was doing through Shuggy Bane in the hopes that I would have their works published is send out these connectors, these characters that were almost holding their hand out to join with another character in a next book or the book after. Because I think mm -hmm. of my work much like a tapestry, you know, uh, my next novel is a very different set of characters, but it is the same milieu. And so I wanted to really create this landscape where all these voices were, were talking about uh, the same sort of time and, and the books are in conversation with each other in very slight, subtle ways in that way. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, Douglas, when is, the, when is this next book coming? When can we expect it? Yeah, it publishes in English uh, in April. Uh, it is called Young Mungo. And Mungo, or Saint Mungo, is the patron saint of Glasgow. Uh, but my Mungo is a 15-year-old young man uh, who is fighting for a territorial Protestant gang and falls in love with a Catholic boy across the other divide. And they are in all kinds of situations of low expectations and, and violence and what it means to be a man. And uh, yeah, as, uh, after Shuggy, I, was in such, I had such a desire to write about sexual desire and about first love and about romantic desire because Shuggy's entire love affair is his mother. And so mm -hmm. this, was, this is my book to do that. And Ian, you have quite modestly spoken of your reading group, but Tolstoy Together is sort of a, it's almost like a movement. <laughs> oh, thank um, you. And there's, and there's a book associated with it. Do you want to? talk a little bit about that. It has just appeared. 
Yes. So the book just came out last week. It's called Tolstoy Together, 85 Days of War and Peace with Yu and Lee. So what happened was at the beginning of the pandemic, I just worried that everybody was lost. And I read War and Peace every year. So I just I just sent out an invitation to the wide world, you know, through social media. I was I wasn't on social media. So I did this with a public space. Mm -hmm. And I thought maybe there will be 10 people reading War and Peace with me. And it turned out about 3,000 people around the world, you know, started reading with me. And we read the whole book in 85 days. My plan was after reading War and Peace, we would exit the pandemic. That did not happen. And so <laughs> we collected <laughs> we collected the reading journal of last year's reading published in a book as a book. So I'm, I started again leading the second reading. Hopefully this time, truly after 85 days, we'll be in a better place. Hmm. So uh, a few more questions here from readers. Uh, two of our readers have asked, about writer's block. Um, the first question is, do you believe in writer's block? And then the second being, what strategies do you use to get past writer's block? Uh, what do you do to clear your mind and allow the flow? Mm -hmm. Douglas. Ah. Um, I don't know how I feel about writer's block, to be totally honest, but I do certainly know that I try to approach my work with a discipline and hold myself to, to producing something. And then I know when I'm angry or when I'm tired or when I'm distracted or when I'm going to write something that I'll ultimately regret and I allow myself to step away from the desk. And so I try to be very aware of myself and, and what it is I'm going to produce. Um, and I also feel sometimes if you can't write for a week or two or three weeks even, that that is okay. You, you have to almost know yourself, but you also have to, I find I have to also know when I'm just trying to cut school and when I'm trying not to do it, and then I have to apply myself to the desk. So it's, you know, sometimes I think not writing is actually a really beneficial thing for a writer. I think we have to do some walking, we have to do some thinking, we have to go out and actually engage with the real world and, and, and meet people and listen to them. And so that's really all I can say about it. I, I try to know myself and know when I'm trying to force it as opposed to when it's really not going to come. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I very much agree with Douglas. I, I don't know if I believe in writer's block, but I also, I used to write every day, but I don't anymore. You know, life is, you have all sorts of obligations in life and it doesn't, I, 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 I think, you know, what matters to me is if there's a reader, if I, I've never had a reader's block, but if I did, I would really worry. I think reading is probably more important. Reading every day is more important than writing every day. But I agree with Douglas is one is both is the discipline. I do, you know, sometimes I don't think, I, I was talking to a young writer and she said, I only have two hours in the morning. I don't have enough time. I thought, well, two hours sounds a long time for me. Sometimes yeah. I just have, half an hour, I would just write one sentence. I just want to write one beautiful sentence and that's it. So I think as long as I can write one sentence, that sounds good. It's not a block. The other thing I do actually, it's quite helpful for myself is I, I did have moments in my life I had difficulty writing. So I would hand copy, it just happened I hand copy uh, War and Peace, you know, passages I liked from War and Peace, but I also hand copy other books I love. Just to have that eye, hand, you know, coordination, just to keep the mind going, keep the hands going. And that is tremendously helpful for me. <laughs> Wonderful. We have just a minute left. Can you each? Name a role model. My role model is, you know, that Charles Shaw's who did the Peanuts strip. If I, you know, I, he's really just my, I mean, he does that every day. He does, he did it every day for so many years and everything by himself. So I, I would say <laughs> he's really one, my biggest role model. Wow. Yeah. 
I think I think my role model has always been the working working class women that raised me in the community around me. When Yu Yun was talking about thirty minutes, actually feels like quite a lot of time to write. I agree. You know, uh, I saw these women having to do so many things in a day, and they never had time for anything, and yet they could manifest whatever whatever they needed to do. And in fact, that I think was just really strong. It's so, there's such strength there. Well, uh, thank you both so much. Thank you everyone who joined us today. Uh, this was a wonderful, wonderful conversation. You did beautifully with my sadistic questions. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was a delight to speak with you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you, Alex.